Life Cycle of a Star with Benjamin Stocker, plus special guests Bill Nye the Science Guy, Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson. Stars tend to be born in one of three places, emission nebulae, absorption nebulae or open clusters. A large cloud of gas and dust, such as this one, is hit by a shockwave, such as this one, which causes it to collapse and take in material from around it. As its mass increases, the rate of collapse increases. As this happens, the temperature and pressure rise inside the core until they grow so much that wham, you get fusion, the marriage of two atoms to create another, a star is born. Now what? A star lives out its life burning hydrogen in the main sequence. It doesn't collapse because the gravitational pressure inwards is equal to the radiation pressure outwards. Bigger stars need more outward radiation pressure, so they burn their hydrogen faster and live shorter lives. As hydrogen in the core is converted to helium, the core gradually shrinks. This increases the rate of fusion reactions and causes the star to gradually move up across the main sequence. And now we come to a fork in the road, which would be true if a fork had one gazillion different prongs. The death of the star all depends on its mass. If the mass is between 0.1 and 8 solar masses, the star will use up all its hydrogen, fusing it into helium. It will then have to fuse that helium into carbon, and when it runs out of helium, it will have to fuse that carbon into oxygen, and so on and so forth. This is a star in its red giant phase, and all that fusing gives the star an onion-like structure. See the similarities? During the red giant stage, fusion is unstable, so the red giant ejects its outer layer, and it looks like this. Once the planetary nebula dissipates, you're left with a white dwarf. It emits very little visible light, has a carbon core, and is very dense. But what if you have a heavier star, say, more than eight solar masses? Remember our fusion chain from earlier? Eventually silicon fuses to form iron. The process is endothermic and stops all other reactions happening. This makes the core shrink and the temperature rise, but the outer layer of the star is still there. It collapses in on the newly formed neutron star and causes a supernova. But now we come to another fork in the road. Well, actually, a fork with three prongs. Well, more like two and a half. Anyway. If the supernova remnant is less than three solar masses, you could get a pulsar. As it spins, its magnetic field rips electrons from the surface and accelerates them to high speeds, allowing us to detect this as we take radio beams to the face. It was originally thought that pulsars were just rotating neutron stars, which are very dense and have low luminosities. There is now an argument that a neutron star is just a dead pulsar. But if you had a supernova remnant that was greater than three solar masses, it would become a black hole. A black hole occurs when a neutron star collapses in on itself and becomes so dense that even space-time ceases to exist. If you're beyond the surface of a black hole, the event horizon, and you shone a light, the gravitational pull is so strong it will pull the light back into the black hole. At the event horizon, the escape velocity is the speed of light. If a person were to cross the event horizon, such as the gravitational pressure, they'd be ripped apart by spaghettification. The atoms and bosons would make them up, would be ripped apart, and then the fabric of reality would also be ripped apart until there wasn't even nothing.